And one more prayer. Father, bless the words of my heart, the words of my mouth, the meditations of our heart. May they be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Good morning. Happy unofficial welcome to summer. I know some people in this room who are particularly excited about that change of the, uh, at least allegedly, the meteorological calendar. I know we've got some heat coming in the next couple days, so I still have a little bit of feedback. I'm going to try not to annoy you with that. If I have to kill the mic and use a different mic, I will, um, but we're going to roll with it for what is going on right now. So Today's reading is interesting, right? So we're in the upper room. This is obviously after the death and resurrection. Uh, we, we now have 11 disciples because, as you know, Judas carried out his own death sentence. And so now there's 11, there's going to be 12 again soon, but right now there's 11 meeting in the upper room. And those 11 are doing something interesting, right? The scripture tells us they're, they're joining in one mind. And for those of you who've been with Firmly Rooted for a while, you know the Greek word that I'm going to get to in a little bit of homothumadon. And that's what we're going to talk about today. But I'm going to start by thinking about what this position must have been like for these disciples. You know, early in my walk as a Christian, I spent a lot of time judging the disciples. Think, boy, you were walking with God himself, and look how dumb you were. Look at how you didn't treat him right. You didn't glorify him right. You didn't believe what he said. Ye of little faith, right? We find ourselves in that position so often where it's really easy to judge them over, you know, the annals of history. As we've gotten now a couple thousand years away, right? It's harder to put ourselves in their shoes. And I think today is one of the big takeaways. I think about times in my life when I felt like I was in a desert or in a drought or in the forge, whatever you want to call it, going through challenges or sufferings or just expectantly waiting for change, waiting for deliverance, waiting for God's promise and not getting it. Have you been there? Are you there right now? I know some of you are. You know, one of the things about the Christian life is we all wish it was going to be easy, but, but these struggles still happen. And sometimes they happen because of our faith. We feel and expect certain things to be going on or going a certain way, and, and they just don't. And we're so confused about God's timing. And to me, that must be the mindset. If I'm to put myself in their place, that must be the way they're feeling, right? We waited our whole lives faithfully waiting for the Messiah to come knowing that he would make all things better, knowing that he would get rid of the Roman reign in our land, that he would deliver it back to us as it's been promised, knowing that all things would be made right when, when God brought the Messiah. We gave up everything. We followed him. We struggled and didn't understand, but we tried, and we've learned so much. And just when it's getting good, we're just getting the hang of, of submitting ourselves to him and we watch him get murdered in the most grotesque and vengeful way. Now what? Then he returns and shows himself. Now what? That's a big question for me and what the disciples have got to be wrestling with. What do we do? We feel like we know who he is. It's been proven. But if we go out and follow and preach what we know, we're going to be killed the same way. So now what? <laughs> it's hard to see that path forward, right? But what do they do? They gather in the upper room, and they prepare. And they begin the practice of homothumadon. Again, homothumadon is a big Greek word, right? So, but it, what it tells us is the best place to start is always in prayer. Because prayer gives us that opportunity to right our heart, to right our mind, to get us in the right perspective first before we act, before we think, before we declare anything else. So they return to Jerusalem, as we said, right? We know that who was there was the 11. This is one of the shortest readings uh, you're going to get for, uh, for a sermon. But what we really want to focus on is even a shorter part of it. These, all with one mind, were continually devoting themselves to prayer. So we have the 11 disciples, we have the women that were with them, we have Mary, Jesus' mother and Jesus' brothers, all together in one mind. One of the hardest things to imagine in today's world. 
You know, I counted this morning, and there's 93 of us in this room. And I bet we would be hard-pressed to get 93 of us in one mind. And that's not a challenge. That's just a statement of the reality that we live in, that everything is so divisive. Even when we love each other, we can be divided. And so what does this mean, to be in one mind? What does it mean? Uh, You know, we look at the different versions of the Bible all struggle, right? Everything that's been translated to English struggles with this phraseology, in one mind, in one accord. And that's how we we all know, right? We're here in in automotive country, and the strange thing is the only biblical car is a Honda, because here we have them all in one accord, right? Oh. Oh. Oh, good. My sons have buried their faces in their hands, so I know my dad joke was effective. (laughs) But what does this mean, right? We never get the, the real meaning in English, so we look to the Greek. And in the Greek, it's this word homothymodon, right? We break it into two parts. Homo meaning the same, you know, hetero, different, homo, same. Thumadon, not something we use very often. But it has quite a meaning when I dug into it. It's often translated as rage or wrath. However, there's a noble thumos, which is the root of the word. And that noble thumos speaks of burning for the good of others, for God's will to be done on earth as it is in heaven, and thus it motivates people to act. Wrath or rage, anger, is usually personal, right? It's born of envy, of self-absorption or vengeance. But thumos is often translated as spirited or passionate. It implies a focused indignation or fight, says the uh, dictionary that I use. So together, we're in agreement about a passion, passionate indignation for God's truth. Well, that gives us a pretty, pretty meaty definition, right? So what I want to focus on is prayer. As I said, this is the place the disciples started, and I think this is where it all starts for us. As we prepare to live a life in connected community, in unity, it starts with prayer. Again, the opportunity to get ourselves right first. There's different kinds of prayer, as you know. There's petitionary prayer, right, which is requesting things, right? And we learn from the template of the Lord's Prayer, right? Give us this day our daily bread. That's a petition, something we need from you, right? Forgive us our trespasses. As we go through, there's all those petitions. There's also intercessory prayer, which is to pray truth over another person, just like we do down here after the sermon every week, where we're connected to someone's need, being a voice for God, speaking truth over them, intercessory prayer. But what I want to focus on, and what I think we need to focus on in this passage, is preparing our hearts for that passionate prayer. The fighting of unholy passions and getting in touch with God's holy passions. Right? So, homothumadon, as I say, can be defined to be together, to become unified with a passionate fierceness. Right? How does this come about? So there's two passions to really focus on today. The first is a passion for God's name to be glorified. And the second is a passion to seek the welfare of our community. And I think that in these two focuses, we really find the answer for how to humble ourselves, how to live this life moving toward homothumadon, and then that preparing us to move toward the greatness that God has in store for us. So a passion for God's name to be glorified. As I said before, the Lord's Prayer is our template. How does it start? Our Father, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. Or your, if you don't like thy, right? It's all about glorifying God first. Before we come to him with petitions, we stop in awe and wonder of who God is, the very creator of the universe, the creator of life itself. We need to stop here and sit here. It's not a line to be sped over. It's a life commitment to understanding the awesome presence of God, to understanding how big he is before we can have any appreciation for how big he is in our own lives. So we're speaking and declaring both to ourselves and to our community, right? That's what's happening in the upper room, that God's name would be worshiped, treasured, and loved. May our thoughts and emotions that arise at the mention of your name be worthy, O God. We don't want to treat him lightly or flippantly. We don't want God's name to be common or of little consequence. It's a big deal. But that God would be primary, at the very center, 
of our hearts and minds, of our lives, of our every focus. We seek this for ourselves and for the people of our community. What I want you to hear is we don't need to make bigger commitments regarding prayer. What we need to do is believe truer and more lofty thoughts about the God we pray to. Your kingdom come, Father. The Christ event established the kingdom of God on earth, and it'll be consummated when Jesus returns. But we have a partial and growing access to eternity here and now, right? The kingdom of God is at hand. In 2 Corinthians, Paul says, Meanwhile, we groan, longing to be clothed instead with our heavenly dwelling, knowing there's something else coming. There's something else there. Clothe us in that righteousness now. We position ourselves for passion of prayer by aligning ourselves with God's rule and reign in our lives. This is what's happening in the upper room. We're aligning ourselves first. We're getting ourselves right. We're getting ourselves out of the way, the lies of this world out of the way, and going, no, first things first. You are God. I am not. You are the almighty, almighty creator. You placed every strand of hair in my head. You are in control. Okay, now we're starting to get to a place where we can grow a little bit, right? When we pray your kingdom come, it's a prayer that seeks to banish all other modern day idols from our lives, to get rid of everything else that we tend to focus on, where we create idolatry even when we don't mean to, right? And then gospel fruit has room to grow. Where God reigns, he brings these into our lives like righteousness, right? Righteousness is an on-off switch. It either is or it isn't. There's no gray area. There's no in-between. And, and, and peace, right? The next, right? So it's righteousness, peace, joy, these, these fruits of the Spirit that come. Peace. Does the Prince of Peace not rule in your heart? This is one of those challenging things to talk about. If I'm feeling uneasy or unsteady and I don't have peace, is it something I'm doing to block the Prince of Peace out? Because he wants to fill me with that peace. He's got a design for my life that overflows with it. And no, I'm not asking you to judge yourself or condemn yourself or hear the enemy tell you you're not good enough or worthy. It's nothing like that. But it's good to discern and ask these questions sometimes in a spiritual discipline, right? We have this, this benefit, right? This amazing thing that when we come to Christ, we're forgiven. We're made right. We're atoned. We're washed clean. But there's a whole life ahead to continue working and getting better and finding more about the promise he has for your life and submitting yourself more to that promise. It's not just a one and done kind of thing. It's now you have the rest of your time on earth to listen and learn to how I want you to live because I know what's best for you. I'm your father and I love you. Right? Same with joy, right? Have other masters taken dominion and are they sucking the joy out of our life? Are we spending so much time on social media and comparing our lives to others and losing the sense of joy because we feel like we're behind? We feel like we're not catching up. We never can, I'll tell you that. Keeping up with the Joneses is as is, is old as time. You never will until you move that stuff out of your heart and make room for the only one who can make your life worthy of living. Are we chasing things, right? Is it addictions? You know, I mean, I could go on and on. But there's an idea that there's defense here, not just offense, right? We must replace the temporal things, the things that will fade away with the eternal. So that in Christ alone, by grace alone, and through faith alone, we may have life and have it abundantly here in our time here. Yes, there's a promise of life eternal in glory with God. But that life is here for you now to be lived. It's not something we must wait for. I want you to hear something. The primary objective of God's kingdom is not to get you into heaven. It's to get heaven into you. Sit on that for a minute. We spend our whole lives, it's this journey to get into heaven. It's about earning it. It's about doing enough and being enough and having enough and being favored enough but that's not why he came. He came to let you know it's here now. It's alive in you now. Stop being a prisoner to this world, for I've broken your chains. 
Mm. So when we position ourselves for passionate prayer, there is this need for defense. And we talk a lot about, you know, the spiritual armor of God. We, and we talk a lot about that in Firmly Rooted. And it's a great study to, to do. We're doing it as a men's group right now. I'm not going to go into all that right now, but it's a whole lecture series on what that defense looks like, how it looks like to defend against the enemy. But we have to realize that there's both sides going on all the time, right? That's part of our responsibility. So passionate prayer begins with being God-focused, God-centered. We don't begin with our petitions. We begin with God. We elevate, worship, and glorify the name of God. We surrender, meaning abandon, our life to the king. God will take your sin in exchange for right standing, peace, and joy. Worship is not about the music or the fog machine or the lights or the coffee in the lobby. No, it's about the heart. It's always about the heart. And hearts turned and on fire and passionate for the Lord will make beautiful worship anywhere. It doesn't need to be in a building. It doesn't need to be on Sunday morning. It doesn't need to be dressed right or have its hair done up. It can be a beautiful thing when it happens organically. So that's, we talk about the, the passion to seek and glorify the name of God. The other passion that I think is, is integral here is to seek the welfare of our community. Jeremiah 29 says, Seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf. For in its welfare, you will have welfare. This verse kind of helps us to refocus toward a kingdom of God perspective, toward that orientation. Church is great, but it's not the goal. Church is the fruit of kingdom activity and ministry. Kingdom ministry begins with seeking the welfare of the city. Never in my life had I experienced this, living in, I think, 15 or 16 different cities before coming to Oxford. I had never seen a, a church or a ministry that was so focused on serving its community and found its niche and found its purpose through that sense of service. Some of the first questions we ask are who out there needs us, right? Hence, we do backpacks for kids. Hence, we start a coffee shop, not even knowing what the desperate need was going to be, but finding it out week after week after week. We humble ourselves as a community and as a ministry to serve first, and amazing things happen. Maybe that's a lesson in our lives, too. We get caught up in, in the rat race. We get caught up in all the things we have to do. But wherever you are, you can serve people. Right? This is the idea of ministry and community. So what is our city? Right? In biblical times, it was a regional hub. Right? You had to be so close to water. You had to be so close to, you know, you couldn't be that far out in the country and survive on your own. Um, so, some nomadic tribes could. But essentially, each city was a central hub. And we see that, right? So many of the books in the New Testament, right? Thessalonians to the church in Thessalonica, Romans to Rome, right? It, it goes on, Ephesians to Ephesus. These were all books written specifically to that city. And in that city had its own culture, its own understanding of the word, its own understanding of their position, right? And so they went specifically into these cities to speak to them, to speak to the issues they were having, both the good and the bad, right? Knowing that in that time, and as it still is now, the people in the city would spread the word out to the country, right? And so they were really effective by preaching to smaller groups and getting that word spread. So history tells us that um, by 300 AD, somewhere between a third and half of the Roman Empire was Christian. It speaks to how highly effective these few were, right? So if you want to affect your world for Christ, seek the welfare of Oxford. Lake Orion, Flint, Detroit. If you want to affect the nations for Christ, seek the welfare of Oxford, Lake Orion, Flint, Detroit. It all starts at home and with our neighbors. It's always relationally based. Tom said something great this morning in Bible study. We were all dead in sin. We were all living in suffering, and God sent somebody into our lives to tell us the good news. God used a person to change the trajectory of our lives at some point for each of us. Maybe for some of us we were fortunate enough that it happened when we were an infant. Maybe for some of us we're in our 70s or 80s. 
and it's just happening now, or we're still waiting for it to happen. There are many out there who still need that, right? But that focus on a community builds those relationships. So in my mind, this idea of passion and prayer breeds a missional focus, right? And there's so many churches around the world and congregations around the world who are mission-focused now, meaning we're changing our measure of success from how do we get people in to how do we get our people equipped to go. That's a big shift in the American church. And so the fruit of that, right, we're all saying we're too busy, I'm just trying to keep my head above water is enough, but the missional question is how will we or how do we best represent Jesus Christ where God already has us? In our relationships with families, friends, neighbors, work, clubs, sports. Are you good news? Are you bad news? Or are you no news? Hmm. So how do we become a people of passionate prayer? We ask God both individually and corporately as a body to grow in us and then to grow through us. For where we're stuck, the wage of sin is death. It's black and white plain and simple, as so few things seem to be anymore. Life is an eternity joined in the glory of God, while death is separation from him in hell. There's no gray area. There's no spending some times with hope and connection and other times feeling isolated and desperate. There's no wishy-washy. It's one or the other. We can't get there on our own but Christ came that we may get there. So, are we working toward being fully in glory or fully in separation, right? It takes practice. It takes intentionality. Yes, grace alone has saved you. I'm not taking away from that. I'm not changing that. I'm just telling you, there are things that are salvation issues and there are things that are, I love you and I want your life to be better, so try living this way. That's what your father's telling you. Try centering yourself first on God, understanding how big he is, and then first ask how you can serve your community. And what you'll find is a lot of those petitions will change at the end by the time you get self-focused, by the time you start thinking about what you need, because your focus has become about God and about others first. I think that's the way he's teaching us to live. And I think that's the way the disciples understood it and why they did exactly what they did. So how do we prepare? Right? Preparation is is a big part of our lives. We have careers, training, and education. Some people are fortunate enough to be called into a career. When they're 10 years old, they know they want to be a teacher. They become a teacher. They're great at it. They enjoy their life. That's amazing. Some people wander lost for a long time and never find it. Right? Right? We, we prepare so many things, right? We prepare a meal for, for a holiday. We prepare our homes by decorating it. We plant gardens that we may reap harvest and food. We have a daily hygiene regimen for, before we go out to meet the world, right? In all the things that we're preparing in, there are times when we're being honed in the furnace, times that we're being made into steel, right? Walking through a desert, And then the other side is an opportunity to encourage because of your testimony, because you pressed on, because you continued, even though you didn't know the answer, even though you didn't feel the calling. One of the beautiful things about this weekend that really is a hard weekend in a lot of ways, but taking time to honor those who have have fallen, those who have made the ultimate sacrifice as Christ did for you and I, that we may be free to be here and worship I see this story every year, it seems like, but there's a troop of soldiers who go out to Arlington National Cemetery and prepare the graves for Memorial Day to prepare those soldiers to be honored once again. And to watch them work, it's this amazing detail where they step to each grave, they salute. They step up and they place their boot against the tip of the stone, and at the tip of their heel, they push a flag firmly into the ground as a decoration so that when you look down the line, every single one is exactly the same distance because it's uniform and regimented and beautiful in that, in its organization, in that someone took the time and the planning to prepare, to prepare that place that people may go on Monday and solemnly honor their loved ones or people they never met. 
preparation can really produce some beautiful fruits. Sometimes it's tough, though. Just like it takes tremendous heat in a forge to create steel to make something useful, preparation can be really hard. Our patience can wane. Our faith can wane. But you know, there's some famous people who would understand what that's like. I've, I've got about 10 here I can tell you about. There's Alan Rickman, the actor who played Snape famously, for those of you who don't know. He had many other roles as well. His first movie role came at age 46. Ray Kroc was a traveling ice cream salesman in the 50s. Wanted to figure out a way to sell his ice cream machines, but couldn't. So he hooked up with some guys who were doing a drive through locally, cooking burgers, and decided, hey, if you open more restaurants, I can sell more ice cream machines. That restaurant is McDonald's. He pushed and grew it to what it is today. He was 53 when he started. Nelson Mandela, 27 years in prison and became his country's president at age 76. Julia Child, famous celebrity chef, the first one, wrote her first cookbook at 50, recorded her first show in her mid-50s. Renowned fashion designer Vera Wang never even attempted to design a dress until she was in her 40s. Toni Morrison and Stan Lee, both 40 before they started their Nobel creations. Well, maybe Stan Lee wasn't Nobel. That was unfair to give him Tony's award there. Laura Ingalls Wilder, same thing. Started writing the Little House books at 65. Samuel Jackson was 43 before landing a role. Betty White was 51. Henry Ford, 45 when he created the Model T. Colonel Sanders, 62 years old when he started a fried chicken restaurant that became the KFC empire. Grandma Moses didn't start painting till 78. And writer Harry Bernstein, who authored countless rejected books, kept at it and got his first hit at age 96. So they all know a little something about spending some time in the forge. Maybe they're just scratching an itch, but they found greatness after a trial. And I want to encourage you that the same is in store for you, in fact, better. When we understand the promise that lies on the other side, we can press on toward the purpose which God has called us heavenward. When we firmly root ourselves in his eternal truth, when we arm ourselves with biblical truth and knowledge, when we're properly focused on glorifying our Father first, focusing on our community second before seeking anything else, when we join in community with each other focused on these truths, when we learn through study that there are facts to assent to, facts about God's goodness, that you are a holy, loved, and redeemed child of God, that you are created in the image of the creator of heaven and earth, that you are set apart as a royal priesthood, that you're divinely designed for a specific purpose and plan. But then when we learn through faith that it's all true, when we submit ourselves fully to God and to his plan for our life, to his calling, when we submit ourselves together as a community of believers to be surrendered both individually and corporately, fighting for God's holy passions, then homothumadon occurs. Then we are one-minded, in one accord, united. There is no more Jew or Gentile, man or woman, circumcised or uncircumcised, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. Homothumadon flows out naturally when we take these steps of discipline first. We're naturally attracted to others who are similarly positioned. We see this all the time in our small groups. I'm actively involved in a couple of small groups. I know many of you are as well. If you're not, I strongly encourage you to be because this is where we get that sense of community, that sense of homothumadon, that sense of how did you just say what I was thinking, that one-mindedness that we strive for. It's not an end goal. It's not something we can impose. But it's a fruit which grows as a result of careful thought, planning, preparation, care, watering, proper sunlight, good soil, all these disciplines that we can carry out in our lives. As we look toward the promise of eternity and the glory of our adoring Father, we can prepare ourselves and his church. Like the bride waiting for his groom, we anticipate his return. When we join in the upper room to de devote ourselves to properly positioned hearts, crying out in prayer for God's holy passion, 
For the disciples, it meant Pentecost. And that's the secret of what's coming, right? Being overtaken with the Holy Spirit, speaking in tongues, raining fire, truly supernatural occurrences, enabling tremendous missional ministry that day. What will it mean for you? What is God wanting to achieve through you? What did he create you for? If it's true, then our lives should change. Do you believe it's true? I want you to know one last thing. Just like for the disciples who gave up their lives, who submitted themselves wholly, greatness lied ahead for them. They could have never known what it was going to be like. They could have never known that they were going to heal people too, that they were going to bring hope. But I want you to know that greatness lies ahead for you too. Not just in a vocational way, although maybe it may be, but the greatness of being able to share the gospel and the faith and the truth and the hope that you have, that we all have collectively, to join together in Homo Thumadon and act as one, impacting our community, impacting our larger world, that is true greatness. And it lies ahead for you. Amen? Awesome. We're going to go into a time of prayer. Um, I believe Tom and I are going to do prayer down here. I got a nod. That's good. So those of you having a need um, or just felt moved by something you heard today, felt like God was speaking to you, maybe you need help identifying a calling, whatever it is, come on up. There's no shame. There's no judgment. Come up and let your Heavenly Father speak to you. Elder Beverly is going to take care of the general prayers. Here she comes. I'll try to filibuster a little longer so she has time to get up here. (laughs) 